<laughs> All right, guest program today is Calvin Snead. Many of you have known Calvin for many, many years. He grew up in Kingsport. His first job was with WKPT TV and radio at the ripe old age 15. After graduating from DB, Calvin went on to UT. We worked at WBR TV and radio and later worked at WIVK along with broadcasting classmate Bob into the checkerboard Kessling. <laughs> Calvin also spent three years as a news reporter and photographer for WTBC Channel 9 in Chattanooga. In 1975, he joined WATE-TV -E in Knoxville, and in 1979 was promoted to co-anchor of the 6 and 11 p.m. newscast. That made Calvin the first African-American to anchor a main newscast in East Tennessee history. He moved to Columbus, Ohio in 1985 as a consumer reporter, anchor, and talk show host. He then spent a couple of years in Lancaster, Ohio as news director for WSWZ Radio. Apparently he had had enough of Ohio because he moved back to Chattanooga. In 1992 to anchor News Channel 9's new consumer watch program. He also anchored the 5, 6, and 11 p.m. news for many years until his retirement. He keeps busy today filling in on the news desk at WRCB-TV, Channel 3, on a part-time basis. These days, Calvin is a bridge photographer, a hobby he's gonna tell us about today. I asked Calvin to bring some books with him today to purchase, because you know, there's only 58 days for right. Christmas. Right. Please give a warm applause welcome to Calvin Sneed. I wanted him to lie just a little bit, but... Well, he's handsome, too. Well, yeah, well, I mean, that goes without saying, but anyway. I'm gonna bring the stand over here, too, so I don't have to. Uh, thank you all for having me here today. Uh, how many of you are anxious to get back to work? Hands? Okay, I'm gonna make this brief, so <laughs> you, might, you might get to do that, and then you might not. I'm gonna talk to you today about steel truss, bridges. We'll also talk about tunnels. Now tunnels are a lot like bridges except the truss opening is a whole lot stronger because it's over a, under a mountain actually. Uh, we're going to visit uh, uh, one concrete arch bridge that's a beloved one right here in our own backyard. I will not be talking about these things. <laughs> concrete beam bridges except to say that they're boring, okay? They're mediocre, no beauty at all. I call them monuments to mediocrity. U-G-L-Y, they ain't got no alibi for building these ugly, no character, no personality bridges. They don't pique your imagination. All they do is get you from one side of the creek and the river to the other side. About as memorable as any episode of the Jerry Springer Show. Hopefully, by the time we're finished, you'll be looking at steel truss bridges and concrete arch bridges in a different light every single time you see them. I want you to see them not as just pieces of steel bolted together. I want you to see them as I do, works of art. Steel beams leaning against the sky, curved arches stretching up into the heavens and then dropping back down. If you look at these things real close, they're nothing but, and you can see it clearly here, they're nothing but a series of triangles. That's all they are, triangles that are bolted together. Now for background, there are two types of truss bridges. The one at the top is called a through truss bridge, meaning all the steel beams in the bridge are on top of the deck that you ride on. The one at the bottom is called a deck truss bridge, meaning all the steel is under the bottom, underneath the deck. Now you'll hear me use terms like, like Pratt bridges and Warren bridges and Camelbacks and Pennsylvanias and Baltimores, even suspension through truss bridges. Don't try to understand any of that. They just describe the type of through truss bridge that it is. I'm going to take you some of the, some of the concrete and uh, truss bridges to, in Kingsport and give you a little history about them, things you never knew about them, like this one, for example. This picture, courtesy of and through special permission from the archives of Kingsport, I'm on the board. I'm on the board. This one's got one heck of an introduction. 
on the west side of Kingsport on the Old Stage Road, which is also called the Lee Highway, also referred to as the Southern National Road, and in the 1920s as State Highway Number 1, and in the 1930s as U.S. Highway 30, uh, excuse me, not 31W, U.S. Highway 11W. What an introduction. This bridge crossed the North Fork Holston River near the junction with the South Fork. It was built in 1913. It's one of, it was one of the oldest highway bridges in Upper East Tennessee. Now the exact type of this bridge is not known, but based on what I know about bridges, I would call it two continuous cantilever Warren through trusses, one of them longer than the other. And I tell you that because according to a news account in the Kingsport Times, it was the largest span closest to the Hawkins County line that collapsed under the weight of an LNC fruit truck headed to Kingsport. The collapse happened about 11 p.m. on June 7, 1936. The article said the driver rode the beast all the way to the ground with fruit flying all around him. <laughs> he said he felt the bridge give way after he started driving across it. Duh, what do you do if it's given way and you're driving across it, right? You stop to save yourself. No, this dude rode it all the way to the ground. In fact, a car coming the opposite way came over the first span and rolled right up to the edge where all those people are standing. And the wheels dropped off about 40 feet above the water and the weight of the car kept it from falling in. People on that side of the bridge pulled the car back from the brink. Now the span that fell was 188 feet long and the highway department says it fell because the truck driver struck one of the beams on the bridge that connected it to the pier. Usually that's that's par for the course. That's what brought it down on the dry side of the river. As you can imagine, the collapse brought out hundreds of people, as you can see, who stayed there to look at that scene all through the night. Well, before the year 1936 was up, the State Highway Department had replaced the collapsed Rotherwood Bridge with this one. Instead of the through trusses, the replacement bridge was a deck truss, 564 feet long. Bridge inspectors swarmed all over this bridge back in 2007 because this bridge was built the exact same way as the I-35 bridge in Minneapolis that fell into the Mississippi River. That collapse killed 13 people and injured 135 others. They were afraid the same thing might happen to this one here because it was built the same way. Uh, let's see, where are we here? Oh yeah. Ultimately, the decision was uh, made to build a new bridge right beside this one. They did it more decorative with the railing and everything, but basically it's a modern bridge that you don't have to do a lot of maintenance on. That's the key. That's the idea nowadays. Both of these bridges are still with us. The older deck truss bridge is now a pedestrian bridge. From the Kingsport News and the headline says it all, 13 tons on a five ton span. How many, how many of you in here remember when you could drive all the way through the Eastman plant on Eastman Road down to Long Island? We all remember that. On December 5th, 1967, the 18 wheeler you see in the South Fork Holston River there on the, uh, just under the span on the uh, right hand side, he tried to cross the river on South Eastman Road and he and his 30 cases of frozen food got over the first three pony trusses on the right but he didn't make it off the first big span. This bridge was a two-span camelback bridge also built in 1913, this one by the Virginia Bridge and Iron Company, according to the plate that I remember seeing on the north span. Now the driver told police he got lost coming up from Greenville on Highway 81. Remember, you know, back then we didn't, we didn't have Interstate 81, but we did have State Highway 81 that came all the way to Kingsport. <laughs> He was trying to come up 81 to get to Highway 23, then go south to the Oakwood Market in Colonial Heights. Somehow, instead of staying north on High State 81 and going up Wilcox Drive to Center Street, he got turned off onto Jared Drive and then Eastman Road, and he got that far right there. Now, for some reason, his sense of direction had him miss this smaller steel truss bridge on South Eastman Road. This one crosses the sluice. This one also had a five-ton limit, built in 1913, again by the Virginia Bridge and Iron Company. This two-span Pratt uh, through truss bridge is still with us today. 
It's actually still here. It's hiding in the weeds on South Eastman Road, close to traffic, but it is still standing majestically over the sluice. Now, I've broached with the, uh, this idea with the city to turn this bridge. Was that something telling you something? I've, bro I've broached this uh, idea with the city to turn this bridge into a pedestrian walkway, tying the Springdale neighborhood on South Eastman Road to a proposed river walk that's going to be built down the sluice on Riverport Road. Well, into that suggestion comes the monkey wrench. It's called Eastman Chemical. <laughs> right now, they've blocked off all of Jared Drive for some big expansion, but luckily, they don't want this bridge. I would still love to see a river walk along the banks of the sluice all the way down to Wilcox Drive and then a river walk tie-in at Wilcox down to Dom Tar Park, including this bridge right here. That would be perfect. Would that even be considered by big business? Keep your fingers crossed, but don't mortgage the farm. This is the old Carter's Valley Road Bridge at Clouds Ford across the North Fork Colston River just west of Lynn Garden Drive. On June 14, 1977, the newspaper article said the very next day, this one-lane bridge was going to be closed for demolition. It was a bridge with two pin-connected camelback trusses built probably before Kingsport Incorporated in 1917. Since there were no dams upriver from Virginia, the Clouds Ford area flooded a lot. and That, all, that always brought out visitors like the ones you see here. TDOT replaced it with a 400-foot long concrete steel stringer bridge in 1977. That new bridge, just a little bit longer than the old one. How many of you remember this grand old gentleman? This was the old airport highway bridge on Highway 75 over the river at the Watauga Dam on the way to the airport. It was built in 1938. TVA raised it about 30 feet when the Fort Patrick Henry Dam downriver was impounded and raised the water level in 1952. This one was five spans, two of them riveted Warren through trusses and the three larger Warren Camelback bridges that you see there in the center. This elegant green bridge was one of the longest bridges in Upper East Tennessee during its heyday. It carried people from Kingsport and Johnson City again to the airport. Steel truss bridges are difficult to maintain and most of them live on borrowed time. In 2010, the Joseph Julian Henry Memorial Bridge, a.k.a. the Airport Highway Bridge, is closed for good. The next year, the still of a quiet afternoon was shattered by progress. Basically, they blew it up. I'll show you that video file at the end of my talk if we have time. The new bridge was built right next to this one. It opened in 2011. Okay, let's go north to Cincinnati. The John Roebling Suspension Bridge on the Ohio River was built in 1866. It is the oldest bridge in that city, and it's still operating today. The chief engineer was John Augustus Roebling. The Roebling Bridge is a mass of cables and wires that gives the bridge its stability. It's 2,161 feet long. It was damaged two years ago when two overweight 18-wheelers scraped up against it. This one you might remember. The Wheeling Suspension Bridge across the Ohio River in Wheeling, West Virginia, it's also a John Roebling Bridge, the longest suspension bridge in the United States when it was built back in 1841. A strong wind made the bridge start rocking back and forth, so in 1854 they tied cables to it to stop the swaying. Those cables are still in place 168 years later. You can sort of see one of them there on the right in about the, center of the, about the center of the screen. And then there's the Kentucky High Bridge on the old Cincinnati Southern Railroad, 275 feet over the Kentucky River, just south of Lexington. John Roebling also designed and built this bridge in 1879. The High Bridge was the first cantilevered bridge in the United States. And here's an interesting fact. This railroad bridge and the entire railroad it's on from Cincinnati south to Chattanooga, Tennessee, is owned by the city of Cincinnati, Ohio. They own the railroad, they also own this bridge, they own all of the bridges on the railroad from Cincinnati to Chattanooga. Back in the day, it was a way for the city to enter the shipping business in the late 1800s because other port cities along the Ohio River, they were already using railroads. They had their own railroads. This railroad was built simply to get 
commodities from Ohio and Indiana south to Chattanooga where it could connect with all the other railroads that were going hither and there. Mr. Roebling had another bridge to his credit, and we tend to take this one for granted. The Brooklyn Bridge is a Roebling Bridge. It was built in 1883. Cars, trucks, elevated trains, pedestrians, bicycles, streetcars, horses, carriages, mice, rats, and anything else that couldn't ford the East River all used this bridge back then. As spectacular as all of those other bridges were, the one in Cincinnati is the only bridge named after John Roebling. Back home we come to, to another steel truss bridge. Does anybody recognize this one? Anybody know this bridge right here? Have you ever seen it? It's right inside the city limits of Kingsport, and it's a bridge that hardly anybody ever gets to see. Keep trying to remember where you've seen it, and I'll summarize why it's in Kingsport. According to the book, and I just got a lesson on this, <laughs> just got a lesson on this. According to the book, The Secret History of RDX, the Tennessee Eastman Company had been producing the explosive chemical acetic anhydride by accident, really, at its refinery near the corner of Wilcox Drive and Industry Drive, right across the street from the Riverview neighborhood where I was raised. I say they produced it by accident because acetic anhydride was a byproduct of the Eastman Kodak filmmaking process. And if you mix several chemicals with it, it becomes the explosive known as RDX. Basically, the government and Eastman decided that World War II was the best way for Eastman to get rid of that chemical, and they could make some money off of it at the same time. That's where this bridge comes in. Eastman and the government needed to ship the byproduct via rail car from the Wilcox Drive plant to the new Holston Army Ammunition plant west of Rotherwood to be refined. And three bridges were needed to get it there along the new interplant railroad. In 1941, Eastman Works manager Herbert Stone found three abandoned steel truss bridges at Lynchburg, Virginia on the Norfolk and Southern or Norfolk Western Railroad and he contracted with the Bethlehem Steel Company to dismantle those bridges, haul the steel to Kingsport, and reassemble them as three bridges across the Holston River to get the railroad tracks from Eastman's plant to uh, Wexler Bend. This bridge was the first bridge on the interplant railroad between the two facilities going east to west. It crosses the river on the other side of Industry Drive, just before you get to the underpass the railroad underpass there at Southern Oxygen. When the leaves are off the trees, if you look really good, you can see this bridge right in there. It's three subdivided Warren through trusses and it's 550 feet long. Folks, I just love this picture right here that I was able to get from Cement Hill. There are actually two bridges on the interplant line that are inside the city limits. You see both of them here. The bridge I just showed you is in the bottom of the picture. The second bridge going east to west is at the top of the picture. That second bridge on the Interplant Railroad crosses the Sluice and Riverport Road. It's also a subdivided Warren through truss bridge, two spans, 345 feet long. This one is the third bridge on the Interplant Railroad on the Sullivan-Hawkins County line. This one crosses the Holston River going into Wex Wexler Bend. It's in the a Amersham neighborhood of the Ridgefields subdivision. It's four also subdivided Warren through trusses. Back to back, it's 720 feet long. It's the longest of the bridges on the Interplant Railroad. Here's one of the oldest bridges in all of East Tennessee. The Thomas Bridge between Bluff City and Bluntville is the oldest documented steel truss highway bridge in Sullivan County. I took this picture in the winter so you could see it, basically, no leaves on the trees. It was built in 1898 to replace a wooden bridge that had been crossing Beaver Creek right there for years. The road it carried was later designated State Highway 37 back in the 1930s. That bridge closed in 1971 when the new four-lane bridge was built over the creek to carry all the speedway traffic. Well, they saved the old Thomas Bridge as a historic ruin, and I have to applaud them for that. The Thomas Bridge lives with us today. Here it is in the springtime. It's a Pratt 
pin connected one span with parapet railing, and I'm sorry to say it's not aging too well. Beaver Creek floods every once in a while, and water does cover the deck of this bridge every once in a while, but the new Columbus Bridge Company of Columbus, Ohio built this one pretty strong. It's 171 feet long. Got a couple of deck truss bridges to tell you about. We were talking about it just a few minutes ago, right again in our own backyard. Along the 277 miles of the old Clinchfield Railroad, there were 16 deck truss bridges, where again, all the steel on the bridge is below the tracks. Right now, we're gonna talk about deck truss bridges number two and number four on the old Clinchfield Railroad. And they're all around right here in Kingsport. On the Hawkins and Sullivan County line, just up from Rotherwood, this deck truss bridge crosses the North Fork of the Holston River. It's 497 feet long, about 60 feet over the river. Built in 1907 as part of the Clinchfield Railroad's expansion southward from Shannon, Virginia, up near St. Paul, all the way down to Johnson City. This one is deck truss bridge number four, six miles down the track from the North Holston Bridge. This is the South Holston River Bridge on the Clinchfield. Now you don't get to see this one a whole lot because it's hidden over that little ridge on the other side of the John B. Dennis Bypass. That ridge that starts uh, where it curves around on the eastern side and then goes up toward Lincoln, or uh, uh, MLK, up towards uh, uh, Lincoln Street and then it curves around to go to Fort Patrick Henry. There's a ridge right there. On the other side of the ridge is the river and this bridge right here. You can't see it, I'm, I'm, let's see, where am I? Uh, that's the Kingsport Water Department's main intake, just past that rocky cliff there, just up from the rocky cliff right there. That's the intake for Kingsport's water, uh, Kingsport's water Department. And I took this picture from right under the John B. Dennis Bridge over the railroad, looking south into the shortest of 55 tunnels on the Clinchfield Railroad. The Holston Ridge Tunnel is 154 feet long. It's so short that you could throw a rock from one end of it to the other. See that jagged edge through the tunnel there on that side? That's a rocky face on the river side of the tunnel. The railroad bridge that you just saw begins right where this tunnel stops. That rock you threw from the other side, there's a good chance it came out this hole, never touched the ground, and fell right into the river after you threw it through there. Only six of the, clinch, of the 55 Clinchfield tunnels have a rocky face like this as a portal. I've never read why they left it that way. It probably saved them some money not laying the concrete. Meanwhile, this view is from the water plant. Thank you, Jeff Fleming, for setting this up so this old bridge hunter could get down to the water plant to photograph this elegant bridge in this beautiful setting. It's a deck truss bridge, 611 feet long, standing about 50 to 60 feet above the water. Now, as long as we're on the subject of tunnels, boy, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna get some haters on this one. How many of you have heard the legend of the old haunted Sensabaugh Tunnel in Hawkins County? We all grew up with that. We all, we have, we've all heard that. The story goes, and it's one of many, that a Mr. Sensabaugh who lived near this tunnel off Big Elm Road in the North Holston River went crazy one day, murdered his whole family, including a newborn baby. He then threw their bodies into the creek that flows right through this tunnel here. Now, as you can see, the legend spread to the walls of the tunnel too. I ain't gonna say that the people who spray painted on top of spray paint to the point of nothing being recognizable were crazy. I won't say they were out in left field somewhere, but actually, if you look at this and compare it to what you see on canvas in the art houses of London and Rome and Paris, <laughs> It actually looks pretty good hanging on the wall there. It really does. You know, it does. Uh, gee, Josie Draven, uh, somebody must really like you to put your name on a wall. I just wonder if there was something about her that scared their friends into picking up the spray cans. Is this place haunted? Are there ghosts living here wreaking havoc on the non-believers? Well, just plain logic keeps me from believing all of, that, all of those stories. I drove my car through it, and hopefully we'll get to that at the end of the talk here. And folks, I'm sorry, I hate to be the one to pull the plug on a perfectly good haunted legend that you grew up with, but this is not the Sensible Tunnel. 
This is not the sense of Baltano. It's more like the Sensabal underpass. You see that flat area up top there at the top of the picture going right straight there where the, where the sky comes through there? That's the CSX Railroad up there, the old clinch field. This opening is merely an overpass for the creek to go under. Just like any passage under a railroad that happens to have a road in it, the street was there before, well actually the creek was there before the road was. This is the real sense of all tunnel. It's on that railroad track about a thousand feet down from that underpass, overpass. You see the ridge on top of the tunnel there? That's sense of all ridge. What the U.S. geological people who map things designated that tunnel. Sensible Tunnel is 348 feet long. It's also part of the Clinchfield expansion from Shannon, Virginia down to Johnson City back in 1907. This is the real Sensible Tunnel. Now, okay, Calvin, as far as this one, yeah, the kiddies can still get scared listening to the stories. You know, an underpass can be a tunnel, and I hate to burst anybody's bubble, but technically Sensible Underpass may indeed be haunted, but I can personally guarantee you the real Sensible Tunnel is not haunted. I know, it's, I, it's nothing but semantics, but hey, I'm a journalist, you know, let's at least get it right. Okay, let's, let's get it right. Okay, from the north side, the Illinois side, this is what, well, I, actually I'm jumping, I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but I'll tell you now that this is the Irvin S. Cobb Bridge in Paducah, Kentucky. Paducah's on one end of the Ohio River, Cross this bridge and you're in Brookport, Ohio. This particular bridge is, the reason it rises up there is because it's getting clearance over the barges in the river. And the drive up that you see on the left hand side there, that's about 60 to 70 feet of incline. And that, that, this view is from the south side, the uh, Kentucky side. This is from the Illinois side looking south towards Kentucky. And you can see how elegant this bridge is. If I have like 20 top favorite bridges, this one is in my top 10. I, I love this bridge. The, it, it actually has two channel spans for the barges to go under. In high water, they go through the one on the left because it is just a, it's longer than the bridges on the other side of the spans on the other side of it. The one that they go through most of the time is the one on the right, down on the far end. Okay, the last Kingsport Bridge I'm going to leave you with is one we all know and love. Some of us, including me, learned how to drive on this bridge. It was named after Hagen Hammond, the first Kingsport Sullivan County soldier to die in World War II, and I'm keeping a watch on the time too. At the time it was finished in 1930, the Hammond Bridge was one of five open spandrel concrete arch bridges in East Tennessee. This bridge was built, built specifically as a showpiece for the new U.S. Route 23 that had just been designated that same year from the Virginia line through Kingsport, Johnson City, and Irwin down to Sam's Gap and eventually Asheville, North Carolina. This is the Hammond Bridge under construction way back in 1929. William Blackwell's father was the engineer who built this bridge for the Tennessee Highway Department. It replaced the old Pactolus Ferry Steel Trust Bridge just downriver from it. William found these pictures and schematics of the Hammond Bridge and knew that I was a bridge hunter. He passed all that information down to me. So let's do some quick comparisons. First of all, what bridge was there before Hammond? Well, believe it or not, that's it right there. That's the old Pactolus Ferry Bridge on the South Holston River. It's there in the background. The Hammond Bridge is being built right in front of it. The Pactolus Bridge replaced a ferry across the river near the old Pactolus Mill that you can barely see in the picture. The barn for it, for it is that building above the new bridge construction there on the left. Pactolus was built between 1905 and 1910, about the time the original Clinchfield Railroad excavation was moved from the Kingsport side to the Kendrick Creek side, the side that it's on right now. 
The Pactolus Ferry Bridge was a one-lane bridge, and since there are no clear records on it, I can only speculate about it. Both spans, as I look at them, were definitely subdivided Warren Camelback trusses. Now, if I, if I had to guesstimate the length, knowing that part of the river, I'd say the spans were about 150 feet long each. With more heavier vehicles to come on the new Highway 23, it's no secret that a one-lane bridge would not support the increase in traffic. Hence the signature heavier weighted concrete arch bridge that was being built right there beside it. Pactola stayed open while the new bridge was being built on a new approach. Now this is looking at construction in 1929 from the south bank looking north toward the hill that Fort, uh, Fort Henry Drive is on right now. In fact, that's the way it looks now. The point at which you, uh, uh, you can see Fort Henry Drive coming down the hill to turn the corner and to come across the bridge. That's where all the traffic backs up right now. The point at which you enter the bridge is at the bottom of the hill on the Kingsport side. This picture shows the bridge almost finished. That far hill in the distance is the ridge above Kendrick Creek that flows into the picture right down there on the right. Today that ridge is still there and the bridge is just as majestic as it's always been. It's none for the worse after 92 years. This is one of the arch mounts under construction back in 29. This is what the engineers call the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow in the arch. This is where the concrete arch comes down and anchors to the bridge pier that supports all the weight. And here is today a picture of that same end of the rainbow, again, 92 years later. How popular was this bridge? Well, here's a postcard of it thanks to Bob Lawrence, the railroad guy. It was mailed by a lady named Marie with a Johnson City postmark dated August 10, 1945, addressed to Miss Nepal Raider, Route 2, Greenville, Tennessee, says, since I didn't send you that card from Knoxville, I promised you, I will send you one today as we are in Johnson City. Having a swell time, back in, the, back in those days they said things like swell. This bridge is one of the crown jewels of Kingsport. As I wind it down, let's talk just a minute about bridge preservation. Many cities are taking the time to consider preserving the steel truss bridges in their towns. I ran into Kelly here on the Shelby Street Bridge in Nashville strumming his homemade banjo. This bridge is now a pedestrian gateway between Music Row and the Titans Stadium. At one point, the Walnut Street Bridge in Chattanooga was the longest pedestrian bridge in the world and one of the longest in the world. Even now, cities are looking to save their steel truss bridges and they're using the Walnut Street Bridge as a model to work with private groups using federal grant money and wrapping these elegant bridges around the history of their communities. Cities like Memphis, they turned part of the Harahan Bridge over the Mississippi River into a pedestrian walkway that it also shares with trains. Louisville rescued the Big Four Railroad Bridge. Cincinnati saved the Purple People Bridge. Uh, oh, uh oh, how did this one get back in there under bridge preservation? Folks, I need to let you in on something. The Hammond Bridge has a 53% sufficiency rating. That puts it on TDOT's list of bridges to either be repaired or possibly replaced in the next few years under the Improve Act. Keep your fingers crossed. If there is a new bridge in this future, personally, I would love to see it saved and turned into a pedestrian bridge, just like all the others and build any new bridge on the Fort Patrick Henry Dam side. Maybe use Hammond Bridge to tie in the Colonial Heights area with the, a new river walk and the greenway to that new park that they're building there, River Bend Park there, tie uh, uh, Colonial Heights into that using the Hammond Bridge as a pedestrian, can you imagine, as a pedestrian bridge? I got to tell you, if demolition is still in the plans for this bridge, don't be surprised if you hear about a guy in a tuxedo laying down in front of a bulldozer, <laughs> okay? Because you'll know who that is, because there is nothing sickening to our history than to have a work of art destroyed, and we didn't try to stop it. So let me see here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out of this thing. There's, there's only one of them that I really want to tell you about, and... Uh, let me let me get to it oh yeah oh yeah let's go through let's drive through the sensible tunnel let's 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 drive let's let's go through that wait a minute here all right here we go 
Okay, check this out. Now listen to this. That, that was the bottom of my car scraping because I dropped off into a hole that I couldn't see in the water. And that ain't all. You hear the squeaking noises there? They say if you drive through this tunnel, your car in this tunnel, turn the motor off, it won't start back up again. Then you look in the rear view mirror and you'll see Mr. Sensiball coming up behind you. If you listen real good, you'll hear footsteps approaching and a baby crying. And just before Mr. Sensiball gets to you, you can start the car up again. Okay, that is pretty creepy, okay? It is pretty creepy. The ghost hunters that write, write about this kind of stuff, they call the Sensiball overpass one of the most haunted areas in all of America. And I'm going to play this and then I'll finish, but I, I, this, is, this is one, this is the Calvin J. Ward Bridge in Kingston, Tennessee, and it's one of the most sickening things I think I've ever, as a bridge hunter and a bridge lover, this just, it, it makes me sad, but it also turns my stomach at the same time. Uh-oh. That just broke, it just breaks my heart to hear that, to hear that countdown and then that whistle that, hey, if you're on the bridge, you got about two seconds and you're gonna end up in the water with it. So I will tell you this right here, the idea for a coffee table brook a book, a picture book, was born from the idea that I've been telling you about today. Steel and trust concrete arch bridges, they've always been there. They've always been there whenever you need them, just like an old friend. I got two bridge books for sale, and I'll call the smaller book The Bridges of Kingsport, Tennessee. I've been to just about all of them. Uh, Gibson Mill Road has a history. Uh, the, uh, the new Interstate 26 bridge up here, it is the longest bridge in East Tennessee. It has a story. It's in the book. I've got it right here. This, the larger book is volume two of the very same book I've got. It's over here. Volume one sold out pretty quick, so I did another one. Again, they're both coffee table books. This one is $25. The other one is $30. And, uh, Every book sold comes with a book bag that uh, you can keep it in, thanks to my sister who went out and got those things, so the dust won't get over it. I'd be honored to sign it for you. I've been told they make great gifts and conversation pieces. <laughs> I appreciate you having me here today. Very quickly, do we have any questions? 